I think there are more people than we realized who have demonic influence affecting them. And so we need to have people with this gift of deliverance to lead us in the effort of setting people free. Deliverance. And this is the special ability to cast out demons and to engage in spiritual warfare. Now, again, this is something we can all do. We all have authority from Jesus to come against demons and, and do spiritual warfare. But at the same time, there are some people who are especially gifted in this area. Aspects. Demonic situations manifest more often. You know, often whatever gift you have, opportunities to use that gift just come up. And when a person has anointing to deal with demons, somehow that seems to stir up the demons and they do manifest more often. And I remember one time I was at a at an evangelistic crusade by a guy named Bill Sabritsky who was into deliverance ministry, and people would just manifest. Now, this wouldn't happen at a normal church service, but at, because it was his evangelistic service, and he was there, somehow his anointing stirred up the demons. The same thing with Derek Prince, who was well known uh, for teaching on spiritual warfare. And he started out as a normal Bible pastor teacher. And one day when he was preaching, someone in the front manifested a demon, and he had to deal with it. And that's how he got into uh, deliverance ministry. And these people are more effective than most at binding and casting out demons. There's more anointing there. They have perseverance in this area. And I'll tell you, people who are involved in deliverance, sometimes they really have to persevere. They have to fast at times. They have to sometimes uh, do ministry for hours. So it takes perseverance. Effective and discerning in spiritual warfare. You know, part of deliverance is really discerning, too, what's going on. Because uh, these demons can hide and be deceptive. Misuse. Uh, seeing demons or spiritual warfare in everything. Sometimes people who are in this ministry just begin to think that, well, anything that goes wrong, it's obviously a demon. But many things that go wrong are just life. You know, there's that story of Satan found sitting on a curb by the side of the street crying. And someone said, why are you crying? And he says, people blame me for everything, even things I didn't do. <laughs> and that's sort of what happens. You know, the light goes out. Oh, it's a demon. The, the auto rickshaw driver charges too much money. Oh, it's a demon. But many things are not a demon. They're just the flesh. They're just the world. So we have to differentiate. Jesus often cast out demons, and his whole life was a model to follow. So this is something he wants Christians involved in. And you look at Luke 13, 31 to 32. At that time, some Pharisees came to Jesus and said to him, Leave this place and go somewhere else. Herod wants to kill you. He replied, Go tell that fox, I will keep driving out demons and healing people today and tomorrow. And on the third day, I will reach my goal. You see? So demon, driving out demons was something that Jesus was often doing. Philip had anointing in this area. Acts 8, 5 to 7, Philip went down to the city of Samaria and proclaimed the Messiah there. When the crowds heard Philip and saw the signs he performed, they paid close attention to what he said. For with shrieks, impure spirits came out of many, and many who were paralyzed or lame were healed. And the apostles 
were healing and casting out demons. The apostles performed many signs and wonders among the people. And all the believers used to meet together in Solomon's colonnade. No one else dared join them, even though they were highly respected, uh, regarded by the people. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. As a result, the people brought the sick into the streets and laid them out on beds and mats so at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as they passed by. Crowds gathered from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by impure spirits, and all of them were healed. And here it says in Acts 19, 11, 12, even handkerchiefs or aprons were brought from Paul's body to the sick, and the diseases left them, and the evil spirits went out from them. Interesting, huh? And here's Derek Prince, and he was the one I mentioned earlier. He had a great ministry of deliverance and teaching about deliverance. And his books are printed in India, so you can get them inexpensively. Uh, he's on YouTube, and so you can really, he's a good source to go to, and very biblical, very solid information on dealing with the demonic. Neil T. Anderson, as well, a number of his books are out there. Reinhard Bonnke, uh, he was a healing evangelist, also delivering evan deliverance evangelist. Those often can go together. And so he dealt with the demonic uh, in people as well. And we can be used by God to break curses. Look at Galatians 3.13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a tree. So as we go out, God can use us to break curses. This photo was taken in 1997, a team I led, uh, co-led from Maui, Hawaii to India. I was taking a Madras there. And at a village south of Madras, and there were no Christians in that village, no churches. And we did a bit of a open air type thing there. And then the pastor said, oh, a woman needs prayer, witchcraft spell. And myself and this guy, John, who's on the other end of the top line with me, uh, we went to pray for this woman. At, and um, she was just sitting on the floor in her hut, perfectly still, not moving. So they just said, witchcraft, witchcraft spell. So we began to pray and break this curse in Jesus' name and so on. And the woman said a couple words and the others said, nundri, nundri. And that means, thank you, thank you. Nothing else happened, really. And we went back to our group. But we found out the next day that woman had been involved in witchcraft she had gotten herself under some sort of a witchcraft spell. She had not been able to eat for several days. She had not been able to speak for several days. In fact, they said for the last three days, she had just been sitting there perfectly still. But the day after we prayed for her, she was walking around, talking, eating perfectly fine. And so the whole village heard that through our, through Jesus, through our prayers, that she was set free. Yet neither myself nor my friend had any big experience in deliverance ministry. But God used us, and God is anxious to use you. And so um, go for it. When, you, when someone asks you, can you pray for this person, step out, and God is with you. So we can, we can pray against these curses. This is a Ravi and Rama, who were in YWAM years ago and had some village ministry along the coast. And uh, there was one village they went to called Odinagar. And in this village, there was people who sold rice beer, a very strong alcoholic drink. And many people were addicted. They even saw school children in their uniforms sometimes coming and drinking this rice beer. So they sensed there was a demonic curse behind this, a stronghold 
And they began to pray against that. They prayed, kept in their prayers for three days and for three weeks and for three months and for three years. They included this in their prayers. Finally, after three years, a government official came to Odinagar and told the people selling rice beer, we would like to you to get out of this business and offered them loans of thousands of rupees to start new businesses. You know, how often does that happen? So our prayers can count. Another place where prayers helped was in the curse of 20. From me, you always get some US, USA history. There has been something called the curse of 20. And what that was is the president of the USA elected every 20 years or a year ending in zero would die in office. They would die while they were president. For example, in 1840, Benjamin Harrison was elected president of the United States. He gave his first speech in the winter cold caught pneumonia, and only a month or so later, he died of pneumonia. Twenty years later, Abraham Lincoln was elected president of the USA, and he was assassinated in Ford's Theater by John Wilkes Booth. 1880, James Garfield was elected president, and he also was shot while president. 20 years later, 1900 was the election of William McKinley, and he also was shot and died while he was president. 20 years later, Warren G. Harding was elected president of the USA, and he died of natural causes while president. Twenty years later, Franklin D. Roosevelt was elected president, and he also died while president. Twenty years later, John F. Kennedy was elected president of the USA, and he was assassinated in Dallas, Texas. Then, twenty years later, Ronald Reagan was elected president. Now, Ronald Reagan was a devoted Christian. He had many Christian friends. And some Christians had heard through the grapevine and so on that there was some sort of curse out there. And what the story was is that back in before 1840, Benjamin Harrison, that first president I mentioned, he was in the Battle of Tippecanoe when the uh, U.S. forces defeated Native Americans. And what happened was the leader on the Native American side was a man named Tecumseh. And he had a cousin whose name was Tenskwatawa, known as the prophet, like a witch doctor. And it's said that he put a curse on the U.S. presidency, because Harrison, who led that battle, was was had become president, and so they they figured that was the origin of this curse of twenty. So these Christians prayed over Ronald Reagan to break the curse of twenty in his life, and what happened? A year later. Reagan was shot. He came out of a hotel in Washington, D.C., and some crazy guy shot him. And he, they raced him to the hospital, and he survived. The first president in 140 years to survive the curse of 20. And when Bush was elected in 2000, 20 years later, also a Christian, a number of Christians prayed for him to continue to break the curse, and he's still alive today. So we can do these sort of things. In 1984, the Olympics were held in USA, in Los Angeles, and many YWAMers, every year, by the way, every year they have the Olympics, 
YWAM always has an outreach there. YWAM had a big outreach at the 1984 Olympics. And so during that time, though, of the Olympics, and, and really during the 80s, this is in 84, but preceding that, there had been a lot of violence in Los Angeles area. And many people had been shot and people were killing and all sorts of bank robberies and violence and things like this. And so the YWAMers would meet every morning before going out for outreach and they would pray and worship and so on. So what they did is every morning when the YWAMers met, they would come against the spirit of violence in Los Angeles. And um, so the Olympics went on for two weeks, I believe. And there was one man who was a police officer, a friend of YWAM. And a few months later, he was attending a meeting of policemen. And they had different speakers at these meetings. And at one meeting, they had the Los Angeles County Coroner. Now, the coroner is the one who examines the dead body of someone who was killed or something to, or died mysteriously to figure out the cause of death. And so they deal with all the dead bodies and so on. So the coroner was telling the police officers, he said, uh, on the average, we see about 48 violent deaths every day in Los Angeles County. And, and someone asked, well, does that figure ever go up or down? I mean, like, it, does it go up on during a full moon or holiday or something? He said, no, it's pretty consistent that we see about 48 deaths every day. He said, except during the Olympics, the two weeks of the Olympics, that figure went from 48 to zero. And we have no explanation for it. And also, we can take our stand against curses or attacks from the enemy that are coming towards us. This is Stanley Prenmuth, who was working in the 81st floor of one of the Twin Towers of New York City in 2001. He was on his way to work on September 11th when he felt like something bad might happen. So he kept praying, Lord, protect me and all my loved ones with your blood. And so he was in his office when the other tower had already been hit and he looked out his window and saw the second plane coming right for him. And so he dove underneath his desk. Instantly, he was covered in debris but then he felt like the strongest man alive and he was able to break free from this debris, made his way towards a, a door uh, to the stairway, but it was blocked by all sorts of rubble. And he kind of shouted and heard someone else and asked the other person, are you a Christian? And the other man said, yes, I go to church every Sunday. And the other man's name was Brian Clark. And uh, he helped Stanley get through the wall somehow get through that door th through all the rubble and he got to the other side and said hallelujah i'm saved and and hugged brian clark and said you're my brother for life well the two then made their way quickly down the stairs came out of the building walked about a block across the street where there was a church and uh stanley looked up and said I think that tower is going to collapse. And Brian Clark said, how would it collapse? It's just a bunch of, you know, the, the only things burning are furniture and carpet. And, and just then the tower collapsed. And later Stanley Prenda said that he believed that God protected him that day because the airplane was heading right towards him. But instead it hit the floor above him. And you know, the Bible says that the enemy comes to kill and destroy. And there was one man who was a 
newspaper photographer, a UPI photographer. He was taking pictures of the Twin Towers as they were burning on September 11th. And he took many pictures, digital pictures, and emailed them out to newspapers across the world. And he got about 100 emails very quickly within the next day or two. And they all said the same thing. They said, do you realize there's an image of the devil in one of your photos? And there is the photo that he took. Sometimes the spiritual can manifest in the physical. So you can decide yourself if that's just a coincidence or if something is there. Then some people noticed that in the second explosion, when after, after the plane hit the tower, that something that looked like a devil was in the explosion. There you can see it there. And there it's outlined. It's not quite as clear on this photo. So I'll show you the video and you can decide for yourself uh, if, that's, uh, <laughs> if that's a manifestation of a demonic manifestation or whether it's just coincidence. We don't know for sure. But in any case, we know that uh, the enemy does come to kill and destroy. Now, in the more personal areas of deliverance, a good example is Mel Bond, who has given both the gift of discernment and the gift of deliverance. And so I'll show you an interesting video of how he used this gift and how he received it. My guest sees demons on people. And when he prays, the demons leave and the people are physically healed. Can ancient secrets of the supernatural be rediscovered? Do angels exist? Is there life after death? Are healing miracles real? Can you get supernatural help from another dimension? Has the future been written in advance? Sid Roth has spent 30 years researching the strange world of the supernatural. Join Sid on this edition of It's Supernatural. Hello, Sid Roth here. Welcome to my world where it's naturally supernatural. My guest, Mel Bond, has a gift called discernment where he can see evil spirits on people, command the evil spirit to leave, and then they get better. I love that gift. When did this start happening in your life? That happened, uh, it began with, in sep no, 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 uh, October 1973, and uh, Jesus, in a vision, uh, said, Mel, I want to take you someplace. And he took me to this, like a large cave, and it looked like it was probably a half a mile wide, and I couldn't see the end of it. It was so, and it was just filled with, uh, horrible, hideous demons making all kinds of hideous noises. And without God's help, if anybody from a natural standpoint was there, it would, it would destroy them. They would die of horror just hearing or just seeing either one. And so I, I've talked to people that have had experiences mm -hmm. like that. And uh, <laughs> unless you had God with you, Absolutely. I totally understand. That's right. And so one particular demon came up to me, uh, and he was probably about seven foot tall, and, and he had fingers that were like eight or 10 inches long, and then he had fingernails probably three to four inches long that curved, and he was trying to slash and, and tear me apart and slash, and he was only getting just, just a fraction of an inch from my face, and it was, such, it was very horrifying. And at that time, I looked up at Jesus, and he was at my right-hand side, and he had a hold of my right hand, and he squeezed it. And I looked up at him, because he's a little bit taller than I am, and he says, Mel, the rest of your life, you're going to go down corridors like this. But he says, always know, I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you, I'll be with you, and that uh, you have power in my name. And from that time on, it, it just an uh, unprecedented amount of encounters have I encountered. 
But the thing that's so exciting to me is after that encounter with the Lord, all of his senses spiritually were activated. And when you teach on this, mm -hmm. Uh, what happens to the people that listen to the teaching? Well, I've done conferences, ministers' conferences all over the world uh, with the gifts of the Spirit and the gift of discerning of spirits that I would very con extremely conservatively say that 80% of all people that are born again, filled with the Holy Spirit, they speak in tongues, immediately they begin to see in the Spirit. Speaking of seeing in the Spirit, in the late 70s, two demons came into your bedroom. Tell me about that. Yeah, in the late 70s, I was awakened in the middle of the night because I heard some footsteps in, in my house. And they, were, they started walking down the hallway, and they walked into the bedroom. And um, uh, immediately, that I jumped up and started swinging at them with my fist because to, you know, to protect my household. And they just began to laugh. And then immediately, of course, I... It was pretty obvious that these were spirits, even though that it was in living color, and uh, they looked like they were physical. And uh, so immediately, faster than machine gun bullets, the, the Lord spoke to me, and he says, Mel, this person that you've been praying for that has a problem with adultery, has a problem with alcohol, that, uh, and I've been working with them for a long time, trying to share the scriptures and things weren't getting any better. He says, this is the root of the problem. The one on the right is a spirit of adultery. The one on the left is a, is a spirit of alcohol. Deal with the, the root of the problem, not the person. And I did, and every sense that is broken off of those, that person. That's such a wonderful gift to have. Tell me about the woman uh, th that uh, you saw a demon on her throat. Okay, this happened down in Taylor, Texas. I was a pastor of uh, a church, a Assembly of God church, and, in, in Taylor, Texas, 707 Lizzie Street. And, um, and I, it was either the first or second service, so I didn't know the people. My wife and I had just started pastoring there, so we didn't know the people. And while I was preaching, that I looked and I seen this lady, uh, probably about 85 years of age, and on her left shoulder, right in this area here, I seen, and, and I could talk about it for a long time, but basically it was a, a demonic force, and it had arms and legs, it stretched all over into her neck region and her body like this. And so I just stopped preaching and I says, I'm gonna take care of a situation in your life right now. And I commanded that force to leave that was in that particular area on her body. And I watched that spirit, it dropped off and it crawled out the back door and then out the, the door and down the street to the left. By the time that it got to the back door, all of a sudden this lady started raising her voice, sort of a, not a real loud shout, but shouting and, and, and saying, praise God, hallelujah, and that sort of thing. And all the church started getting real excited. And I'm thinking, well, I don't think this is such a big deal. Why is everybody so excited? And then when things calmed down, the lady spoke and she says, I had a stroke six months ago and I've not been able to talk for six months And this sort portion of my body had been affected and all of that was totally gone. So like you normally can see this demon, you command it to leave, can you see and you see it leave. Absolutely. And you you told me over dinner last night that when you're ministering to people in, in a congregation, you just look over the whole congregation and God shows you things. Absolutely. About I'm, I'm every time I preach I kind of walk around through the crowds and I'm looking I'm looking for problems. Really, I'm looking for demons because I'm absolutely thoroughly convinced according to the teachings of De Jesus and the Word of God that every problem, there's a demon. Jesus said, if you're not for me, you're against me. And so we don't have three choices. It's either of God or of the devil. And so if there's a problem, there's a demon. And if you would get to get to the root of the problem, then the problem can be fixed. Okay, this isn't a congregation. Just out of curiosity, when you're going out to the barber shop or wherever you're going, Same thing. You, see, you see that. Do you ever do something about it? Oh, absolutely. I was in a place of business just a, a few months ago, and all of a sudden I looked, and uh, there was a demon on the top of this lady's head uh, right there. And so I just walked over and I says, you know, I see a problem that you have in your head. Can I pray for you? And uh, she looked at me and kind of puzzled and shocked in place of business and people all around and everything. What a wonderful place for God to get glory. And uh, some of the people, they don't go to church, so we got to bring church to them. Just out of curiosity, did you know what happened when that demon left? Uh, absolutely. That, uh, it, it totally left. 
And then she began to smile and tears just flooding down her face. This happened at St. Charles uh, Boonslick Medical Center in St. Charles, Missouri. And uh, uh, I was there getting my annual physical. And so immediately she cried and she says it was totally gone. And she says, I've had an excruciating migraine headache for, I think she said three days. And she says, nothing works, nothing gets rid of it. But she says, it's totally gone. I'll tell you, to me, it's not scary. Scary is having these critters and not being able to see them. Absolutely. Once you see the authority that you have to command these to go, it's the most wonderful gift in the world. Don't go away. I'm going to be back after this word, and you're going to find out how every area of your life can be affected when you understand Mel's teaching on discernment. Be right back. We'll be right back to It's Supernatural. We now return to It's Supernatural. Hello, Sid Roth here with Mel Bond. And Mel, one of the things you told me is that demons prevent believers from being all that God's called yeah, them to be. Explain a little more. Oh, I'd love to talk about this for two hours, but we don't have time. But basically, the Lord showed me that if a per until a person, 100% of them, wants to be rid of this problem, that demon still has authority, and he still can rule. And so I'd like to say people within the sound of my voice, ministries, you'll never be, and people will never be everything that God wants you to be, and you'll never have everything God wants you to have as long as there's 1% of you that doesn't mind that fault or that problem that you're dealing with. If you don't mind it being there, you've got to, with your whole heart, the Word of God says that you will find me if you seek me with your whole heart. If there's 1%, those demons, they know, and they have rights to stay there, and you know they're still there. And so they need to, with their whole heart, live for God. And then they can have everything that God wants them to have and be everything that God wants them to be. You know, what you're saying is triggering a thought with me. Um, a friend of mine was watching the Oprah show, right. and there was a woman that was a well-known country singer that said as a child she had thoughts of being a lesbian. And she prayed to God, and God didn't take it away, so she felt that's the way God made me. I, I love God, but this is the way God made me. Do you believe that that's a demon that perhaps she had that one or two percent that she was holding back? Here's one of the things people don't realize. We are at war with the devil. Second Corinthians chapter 10, the Bible says that uh, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. The weapons of warfare, they're not carnal, but they're mighty through God. And then it goes on and it teaches us this is the progressional step of how people become demon possessed. It's first thoughts and after thoughts, then imaginations, then the stronghold. And so we've got to get rid of those thoughts because those thoughts are after, they're going to open the, I call thoughts demons that are door openers. That if we keep entertaining the thought, he'll open up the, uh, the door to let a worse demon come in our life. Then we become obsessed. And then after a period of time of being obsessed, we become possessed of the devil. Mel, tell me about the time that you had chest pains. Okay, uh, this goes back, if you remember the interviews prior, if people listen to this, Back in 1973, when Jesus took me down that corridor, that demon, that big, tall demon that was trying to claw my eyes out, well, uh, I started having chest pains earlier than that. It was in 1972. In fact, it was in uh, October 22nd, 1972, and I started having chest pains, horrible chest pains. I thought I was going to die, and I fought those chest pains for many years, and, uh, but then it was right around 1990 that I woke up in the middle of the night, and... Uh, I seen that same demon that was in that corridor, and he had his right index finger in my chest, wrapped around my heart, and I, it was just like what woke me up was because of the fact that I had such horrible chest pains, worse than they'd ever been, and it was like I knew I was going to die any second. It's just like I knew that I knew that I knew, but when I woke up because of the pain, I seen that demon standing over the top of me with his index finger around wrapped around my heart, and faster than machine gun bullets again, the, the Spirit of God spoke to me, and he says, you don't have heart problems, it's that demon, get rid of the demon, and the problem's gone. And so I rebuked him, I told him, in Jesus' name, you have to leave, and, and then immediately he started pulling his finger out of my chest, very slowly, 
And by the time he pulled his finger, as he was pulling his finger out of my chest, that the pain, the pain decreased. And when then it was totally out and he was standing there, he started just disappearing right in front of my eyes. And within, it probably took about 20 minutes to a half an hour, and all the pain left, and just micro portions of it, I mean, just microscopic little hints of it would try to come back every now and then for maybe a couple of years, and I knew that it was that demon. And so I just said, no, 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 you're not coming back in Jesus' name. I have authority over you, and it would leave. And so now it's been, my goodness, I don't know how many years, not an ounce of any kind of chest pains or any problem. Well, in your own life, uh -huh. uh, the doctors told you and your wife you had one chance in 100,000 of having right. a normal baby born. And I'll tell you what, when we come back, we'll talk about that. Don't go away. Be right back. We'll be right back to It's Supernatural. We now return to It's Supernatural. Hello, Sid Roth here with Mel Bond. And Mel, the doctors told you and your wife that you only had one chance in 100,000 of a normal child. Um, uh, you had uh, three stillbirths and uh, or three miscarriages and a baby born deformed. And uh, why did you continue trying to have children with that doctor telling you that? Because we believe the Word of God and we stood on God's Word. And so during the night session, that uh, I, I was awakened and I seen this demon and it, it was over the top of my wife's body, the lower parts of her body, and faster than almost than you can think. I mean, it's so quick. It was like I could see throughout infinity out towards the east, eastern skies, and I seen this uh, angel come rushing out of the east and it came down and wrestled with this demon and then run him off out into the southwestern skies and at that time we were living in St. Charles, Missouri and then that angel came back and, I got, and he got on his knees and he put his hands in the lower parts of my wife's body and uh, we had three perfect children. How were you praying back then? Well to the best of my ability with my, with my whole heart but more than anything we were just standing on God's Word. We just said God's Word is truth and we're going to believe it and um, now, tell me, tell me, when you raised your children, did you teach them about discernment and did they move in discernment? Absolutely. Did they, uh, did they understand deliverance? Tell me about that. That uh, I would teach my children as soon as they begin to understand and talk that I would tell them that if they would have flus, colds, fevers, the typical things that children get, and I would teach them, this is, a, this is a spirit, this is a demon spirit. And I'd come in there in the bedroom many times during the night session, and that was my job. You know, my wife would do the other things, but I'd come in there and, and then I would pray, and it'd break it, it'd break it. And I'd say, now if that spirit tries to come back, you just take authority, you just say, in Jesus' name, you can't, you can't stay. And you'd hear them little girls in there talking <laughs> in their voices and say, in Jesus' name, even one time, my, uh, my middle daughter, her name was Chantel, and she, she's about three years old, and she says, Devil, if you come back, I'm going to squash you like a bug. <laughs> <laughs> Out of the mouth of babes. Uh, I've got a report here, medical uh -huh. report, on one of your daughters uh, about her eyesight. Uh, she was legally blind. Tell me about that. Okay, she was legally blind, and, uh, you know, Jesus said in John 16, 24, he says, Hitherto have you asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you shall receive, that your joy will be full. Well, that word ask means more than just speaking out of your mouth. It says to crave and to, to demand what is due. Not demanding God, but to demand the devil to get away. And that my joy be full. Well, my joy can't be full if my, if my child is my baby sure. daughter. Caress, she's blind. And so uh, I got some charts, uh, legal charts, eye charts, and, I be, and, and, and so I prayed for and I looked into uh, the realm of the spirit and I seen the, the, the demon spirit of blindness, I commanded leave, and so she had perfect eyes, better than perfect eyesight, <laughs> better. And, uh, and, and so she went back to the medical doctor and you had the reports. Speaking of medical doctors, tell me about that heart surgeon that came to one of your meetings. Okay, 
Uh, he was a, a, a person that, he, he said he was a Christian, but he just didn't believe in healings and miracles. And he came to a service in North Carolina, and uh, he said that, well, the upshot of the whole thing is, let me start back, that I was preaching. And when I was preaching, I didn't know these people. It was the first time I'd ever been to this church in my, in my life. There's 300 people, something like that there. And I looked back, and I seen this man. I seen in these chests, and I seen the demons, and I could tell you where they were wrapped around these arteries and on these heart region. And I just told him, I says, you've got problems here. And I described it. And I didn't say it was a demon. I didn't want to scare him. Some people get scared by that. And so I just said, there's a problem here, and, and it's causing a major. And, and I told him where it was intricately. And then I says, I'm going to get rid of it now in Jesus' name. And so I did. And then he got real excited. And he says, I felt that. I felt that. And he says, I know it's gone because I feel so much better. And then he made the statement. He says, he says I'm a, I think he said he's a, a heart surgeon. He says, I'm scheduled to have open heart surgery to do exactly what you said. He says, I want to know where you got your training. And I <laughs> says, I just got my training from Jesus. He lets me look inside the spirit world and see, look inside of bodies and see if there's things wrong. And he says, I came to this service to prove that you was a, a, a fake. And he says, now I know that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and that healing and miracles are real. You know, Mel, it's wonderful that you move in this supernatural gift of discernment. But when people read your book or they attend your conferences, do you get many reports of people that start moving in these gifts of discernment? I would say immediately. I just came from Japan where I did a, a, a pastor's conference, and I had some very credible ministries that are even friends of Dr. Paul Yumi Cho that said, this is the greatest meeting he's ever been in in his life. And it's only 45 minutes, a small meeting. And immediately, in there, I think there was like 95% of those ministries. And here we have a, a language barrier. And hmm. there was like 95% at least. Started moving into sermon. Immediately, they started seeing in the spirit world and seeing spirits, which is so hmm. important because people need to realize that's the root of all of our problems. Now, you talk about love conquers the devil. Absolutely. Love stops the devil. Explain that. In the natural world, natural-minded people, if they seen a spirit, it would horrify them because it's a dimension they're not familiar with, that they're not schooled in, so they don't believe in it. And so Satan doesn't know about love. Love is a dimension. God's unconditional love is a dimension that Satan knows nothing about. It's the secret place of the Most High God. And so when we operate in love, that we get into a dimension that absolutely torments the devil. And it's, it's one of the greatest forces because what is love? Love is God is love. He is unconditional love. And I, and I think that's one of the major reasons that the devil fights people getting in love. If you read 1 Corinthians in chapter 13, it talks about the nine gifts of the Spirit. The devil knows if he fights all the gifts of the Spirit, he's got nine battles on his hand. But it says if we don't walk in love, then none of the gifts are. So he knows all he has to do is fight us, keep us from operating and, and living in unconditional love, then none of the gifts work. None of so, them are So that's are probably why he, he, he has problems between husbands and wives, parents and children. Because if he can stop this love, he, stops he wins. But if someone moves in love, it, it mystifies him. Absolutely. We actually, when we walk in love, we're walking inside of God. That's the reason the Bible says walk in the Spirit. When we walk in love, it's just like we're encased by God. We're in the secret place of the Most High God. What's the secret place? Remember when you were a kid, you'd play hide and seek? Right. And, and, and the, the, the greater that you could hide, then you can't be found. And the devil can't find us if in, we get in God's unconditional love. Okay. What's last thought? Well, my last thought I, that I'd like to bring out is in the book of Mark, the Bible says that the rich young ruler came to Jesus and Jesus was giving him the greatest opportunity that he'd ever have in his life. And he, and Jesus said, there was only one thing that kept him from that, 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 that he wasn't trusting God, that he had, he had fear of trusting God with his finances. And so what I want to say, it's the same thing today. I would, I'd be willing to say that 100% of the time, there's only one thing, and it's a demon, there's only one thing that keeps people from experiencing the grand finale that God has for them in this life. 
I, I've never looked at that, the rich young ruler, that way. Yeah. So you believe that there is an evil spirit behind just about every physical illness and every problem between people? I see it. See it? I see him. I see him. The Lord has shown me how that I can do this at my will anytime that I want. And I see it. I wish people could see the way I... And, and I can train people to where that they can see too because it's all in the Word of God that there's over 700 verses just in the New Testament where it validates the, uh, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 and 4, which says, God has already given us all things that pertain to this life and godliness. What's godliness? God-likeness. You'll know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Now, even though there are people like Mel Bond, who God has given an extraordinary gift of deliverance, all of us can be used in this area of deliverance. All of us can grow in this area of deliverance because Jesus promised so, such as uh, you look in Luke ten nineteen, Behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. Nothing shall by any means hurt you. Ephesians 6, 10 to 11, finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may not, you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. And Mark 16, 17, and these signs will accompany those who believe in my name. They will drive out demons. They will speak in new tongues. 1 John 4, 4, greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. So you can step out and be used in this area of ministry. So here, here are just a few um, suggestions or rough guidelines that may help you if you get involved in deliverance ministry. If you're asked, if your team is asked to go pray for someone who has a demon, these are some things that may help. One, holiness and a strong prayer life. You simply need to be ready in the sense that you need to be walking with God strongly, have no unconfessed sin, and be strong in prayer. That's going to help you. I heard about one group of people that were praying to cast out a demon, and the person who was possessed looked at one, looked at one person and said, You, you're living in adultery. You'll never cast me out. Number two, do deliverance as a team. So it's far better to do as a team than alone, and never a man and a woman alone. That's a bad situation and a dangerous one as far as accusations and things can happen. So avoid that. Number three, worship in the background can be helpful. So if you're able to have that happening, that helps. Number four, stand in your authority of Christ. You don't go in your own strength, but in the strength of Christ. Number five, make sure the person repents before as much as possible. Because, obviously, the reason this demon is in them is because something has happened. And if they have sinned, if their sin is the reason, you want to help them repent of that sin so the door will be closed. Cancel and renounce all sin. Number seven, remove any hindering objects on the person or such possessions. Sometimes they may have an amulet or a bracelet or something, maybe even something in their house. Now, you can't actually remove it yourself. You're asking them to remove it so they can be free. Okay. Number eight, make sure they give forgiveness to all. A lot of people can come under demonic influence through unforgiveness and bitterness. That's a big one. So you need to make sure that they are giving out forgiveness. Number nine, gift of tongues can be helpful. So if you're able to speak in tongues, use that. Demons hate it. They really don't like it. And obviously that's because it has power. Ten, follow the leading of the Holy Spirit. Every situation is a little different. So that's why I'm saying these are just rough guidelines, rough ideas that may help. But but you need to really follow the leading of the Spirit. He may lead you to do something 
uh, unique and follow that. So that is deliverance ministry. All of us can be used in it. And as you all step out in this area, you will find that some of you have a, a, an exceptional gifting in this area. You may discover that maybe this could be your ministry. Now, all of us can be used in this area of deliverance, right? Jesus told all of his disciples, go cast out demons. All of us can use that authority to do so. At the same time, there are some people who seem to be more extra anointed in this type of ministry. For example, I was in the School of Supernatural Ministry. I was one of the staff. We went on outreach to Mumbai, and we had one guy in our team named Alfred. Now, Alfred was relatively a newer Christian, and what we found as we began to do some deliverance type ministry is Alfred just obviously had the anointing and the power behind him, much more so than than the rest of us. So we tended, we eventually just kind of let him lead that part of the meeting. I remember one time as we, we, were, we were praying for all sorts of different people at the same time. And one time I went up to this one woman they could see she had some bondage and I was praying for her. We could tell she had a demon. And as I prayed for her, her eyes kind of, you know, got wider and there was some effect there, but I wasn't certainly not succeeding in casting anything out. But then when Alfred came, he had both this gift of discernment and, and anointing and deliverance working together because he discerned that somehow the husband had a big effect and he was praying over here. And eventually these people were set free. So as you, as you all step out and begin to do more deliverance, you'll probably find some people who have extra anointing and let them lead the charge. And as a team, we can see many people set free. And now we're getting into creative communication, letting our creative creativity fly and finding new ways to express biblical values and the gospel message. Creative communication. This is the ability to communicate the truths of God through a variety of art and communications forms. So these can be things like drama. And YWAM has been known for pioneering this area of outreach. Dance. Art, like painting, sculpture, etc. Writing. Could be fiction, could be nonfiction, could be poetry, or other things. Photography. Videography, making movies, making documentaries, this sort of thing. And more. So creative ways to spread the truths of God. Misuses. Well, one would be using previous ideas that worked. This is something we've seen in YWAM, for example. Like you'll have dramas from the 70s that could be still taught and used today. We need to come up with new things. Maybe we don't need dramas. I don't know. It depends on the situation and where you're going. But, uh, you know, there was a story about one YWAM team in India, and they, you know, were taught the usual dramas. There's one called the chair skit. It's one of the oldest dramas in YWAM, right? And they went, this team went to a church, a youth group, uh, to do so, a program for them. And they did the chair skit, and, and someone in the team didn't quite know how to do it properly. So the people in the audience were, were helping because <laughs> they had seen this chair skit so many times. So we need, if we're going to do dramas, we need new ones or maybe some totally new ideas beyond that. So always pray and ask God, what new ideas can we work on? Using these art forms to express worldly values. Of course, the values that we express 
should be godly values. One example from the Bible would be Ezekiel, mentioned in Ezekiel chapter 4, where God told Ezekiel to get this clay brick and draw Jerusalem upon it and lay siege to it and put an iron pan between him and it and then measure out certain amounts of, of food and all these different things symbolizing that there would be a siege on the city and people would go hungry and these sort of things. So it was a creative way of expressing to the people. So, of course, we have drama. That's one way of creative communication. And, you know, the Hindus use a lot of drama to spread Hinduism. So it's, it's a good way to be able to communicate to people in certain places. These Keralite dancers, they put a tremendous amount of effort. I saw a documentary in which they talked about just all the effort they do to do the makeup and the costumes, hours and hours of work. So we should be ready to do some interesting quality stuff. Here's a passion drama in Leicester, England, that they have done in previous years, attracting big crowds, a creative way to spread the gospel. And then, of course, we have film, right? Film and video, like the Ten Commandments and Covadus. Covadus is a film about the early Roman Empire and the Christians in it. years of conception, of planning, and actual production, Covadis has been completed, and a dream has been fulfilled. Covadis was filmed in Rome, amid the actual sites of its historic locale, through the vivid reality of color by Technicolor, Imperial Rome is recreated, glorious and corrupt, awesome and hallowed. Here you will meet Marcus Vinicius, Robert Taylor. Through a performance of masterful artistry, he will have lost his own identity and become Marcus Vinicius. Brave warrior, generous and yet capable of cruelty and unbridled self-will. And here, with Marcus Vinicius, you meet Lydia. Christian slave girl, who in time will dominate his life. Deborah Carr is Lygia, a pagan to his fingertips is the suave and ironical Petronius. The eminent actor Leo Gen recreates Nero's arbiter of elegance. And here is history's evil genius, Nero. Under the forehead of a demigod and the face of a beast, he was a drunkard and a sensualist, full of changing desires and swollen with fat and crime. So has history described him, and so he is recreated by Peter Ustinov in a magnificent performance. The Empress Poppea, the hard and calculating wife whose hand shaped the fate of Nero's world. The giant Christian slave Ursus, a man of tremendous strength and the gentleness of a child. Here the fisherman, Simon called Peter. In all there are 110 speaking parts in Quo Vadis, an unprecedented cast of 30,000 men, women and children. You will see thousands upon thousands of players appearing in a single scene. No achievement in entertainment history has equaled the panoramic spectacle, the splendor, the power, and the compelling human drama of Quo Vadis. It is an experience which cannot be compared with anything you have ever known before. You'll witness the infamous revelry of a night in Nero's court. You'll stand with the Christians in the catacombs. 
See the battle of the giants. You'll know the love of Marcus and Lygia. The spectacle of Nero's circus. The terror of the arena when Ursa stands alone against death. happening that will be remembered as long as history, the burning of Rome. <laughs> Standing here in the shadows of antiquity's pagan gods, you will join with Rome's roaring multitudes as they honor their victorious warriors. And you'll know why Quo Vadis has been called the most genuinely colossal movie you are likely to see for the rest of your lives. Then there was Ben-Hur, a classic movie, uh, the, the better one being with the, the old classic with Charlton Heston, and another one with Richard Burton called The Robe, and the most viewed film in history, the Jesus film made by Campus Crusade for Christ, seen by more people and translated into more languages than any other film in history. If you haven't seen it, it's very good, very uh, realistic depiction from based off the book of Luke. For my eyes have seen your salvation. This child is chosen by God. Everything written about me in the law of Moses and the writings of the prophets and the Psalms had to come true. In his name, the message of repentance and the forgiveness of sins must be preached to all nations. The winding roads must be made straight, and the rough paths made smooth. And all will see God's salvation. This very day, your Savior was born. He is Christ the Lord. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has chosen me to bring good news to the poor. who exalts himself will be humbled and he who humbles himself will be exalted the Lord bless you and keep you and teach all nations in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit he has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind to set at liberty those who are oppressed and announce that the time has come when the Lord will save his people. How happy are those who have no doubts about me. It is written, my house shall be a house of prayer, and you have turned it into a den of thieves. The Messiah must suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. Ask, and you will receive. Seek, and you will find. How happy are those who hear the word of God and obey. And there was The Hiding Place with Corey Tem Boom, the movie about her life and how they saved the Jews and went to the concentration camp and all these things. You can probably, I think you can find that one on YouTube. The Search for Noah's Ark. There's some movies about Noah's Ark. The Passion, made by Mel Gibson. And uh, The Encounter, that one might be on YouTube. That's a good one. Narnia. And, of course, The Lord of the Rings. The world is changed. 
and some things that should not have been forgotten were lost. For the first time ever on Blu-ray, the Lord of the Rings trilogy. It's wonderful to see you, Gandalf. All three original theatrical versions come alive in stunning Blu-ray high definition. The Fellowship of the Ring. You have my sword. And you have my bow. And my axe. The Two Towers. The defenses have to hold. They will hold. The Return of the King. This is your test. Every path you have trod through has led to this road. Let Blu-ray bring you closer to the wizardry. The ring is trying to get back to its master. It wants to be found. Closer to the treachery. We're not alone. to the triumph. All you have to decide is what to do with the time that is given to you. Now the power of Blu-ray lets you experience the wonder of the Lord of the Rings, the way it was meant to be seen. The end has come. You carry the face of his old little one. Winner of 17 Academy Awards. Even the smallest person can change the course of the future. The Lord of the Rings Trilogy. Look for it on Blu-ray. The Cross with Arthur Blessed, uh, the, a series on the Bible, Fireproof, War Room, Left Behind about the end times, Pilgrim's Progress, and Courageous, and they, they keep making more and more Christian films, which is wonderful. And you may end up making Christian films or videos and not just English speaking ones, but there is a lot of demand for ones in different languages. So you may want to make some uh, in more local languages to reach out to those people. David Cunningham, Lauren Cunningham's son, is a film producer. And he has made some movies that did uh, get into the movie theaters, such as To End All Wars. And the story of that was about American prisoners of war who had been captured by the Japanese in World War II. And so they're in this prison camp. And these prisoners at first were stealing from each other and backbiting and doing anything they could to survive. But then what happened is they were forced to work on a construction of a bridge or something, and they had tools, and every day they had to bring the tools back to the Japanese. And one time the Japanese counted the shovels, and there was one shovel missing, they said. And so they said, who has that shovel? Who took that shovel? And nobody said anything. And so the Japanese officers said, all right. If no one's going to confess, we're going to start shooting people until someone confesses to taking the shovel. Then someone stepped forward. And they said, okay, now we know who did it, and they killed the guy. Then they counted the shovels again. It turned out there were the right amount of shovels. No shovel was missing. This guy just gave his life for the others. That guy had been a Christian. Other prisoners were very impacted by that. This is a true story. And the, a number of prisoners ended up accepting Christ, and they all began helping each other instead of working against each other. And so this whole transformation is in this movie to end all wars. Sit down! Oh. 
Take a look around you! You tell me what you see. Hope, Ernie. Hope. The greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. What does it mean to love one's enemies? How many times shall I forgive my brother? What can a man give in exchange for his soul? These are the questions that I faced in the second war to end all wars. The answers changed my life forever. And another movie, David Cunningham made was The Seeker, and he's made a number of others as well. The last I heard, he was actually working on a movie about YWAM. I think the title of the movie is Go, but of course, uh, the current situation may be slowing that down. And also, there's creative communication in art, and this could be any form of art, but if you have artistic talent Work on expressing Christian values in art. We certainly need more of that. There's many people who are unfortunately are expressing worldly wrong values in art. So we need biblical values expressed in that way. Uh, last year, I was in La Navla and uh, at the center there, YWAM Center there, and I made some uh, paintings with Bible verses for the dining area. All these verses had things to do with food. So I think those may still be up there in La Navla. So different creative ways. So my main advice in this area is pray and see what ideas God gives you. And then also think about what areas of creativity are you gifted in and ask God, how can I use that area to better express the kingdom of God? Well, those of us who are in YWAM are meant to all meant to be missionaries. We're youth with a mission. So let's get started. And the gift of missionary. And this is the ability to minister with one's spiritual gifts in another culture. Some people think, well, I have to be an evangelist or a church planter to be a missionary. Well, no, it, you just need to use your gifts to help the efforts of furthering the gospel in another culture. I mean, I knew one guy who was a very good evangelist in Honolulu, and he would just win people to Christ all the time. One time he went up to some teenagers, shared the gospel with them. They all accepted Christ. And then the Holy Spirit fell and they all began speaking in tongues. <laughs> and, and he didn't even say anything about tongues. You know, this guy was so anointed in evangelism. But then he went on outreach to Thailand and he, he had a bad time. He didn't really get into the people or the culture or the place. He just, he just did not gel. So he had the gift of evangelism, but not of missionary. Then I have another friend who wasn't very evangelistic or really outgoing, more of an introvert. But he came to India for many years as a missionary. And he was helping with computers and, and things like that. And he was a good help, but not in the traditional way you would think. Here are some aspects of missionary. Enjoy travel and adventure. That's an often a trait that is in missionaries. Can adapt and re relate well to other cultures. They want to go where they're needed. Motivated to reach the unreached, you know that that motivates me. You know to, to go when I go to places where there's fewer Christians. Uh, flexible, 
you know, plans change and they flow with it. You have to be flexible because Jesus said, blessed be the flexible for they shall not break. Well, Jesus didn't say that. I think Lauren Cunningham said that, <laughs> actually. Um, misuses. Exporting your culture with the gospel. That is, you go to a new place and say you were planting a church or something, and, and you have them do everything in the way of your country, but don't adopt it to their country. Rejecting the culture of the host country with the religion. So you have to separate what's religion and what's culture and not just reject every way the people in the country are doing things. Paul and Barnabas were early missionaries. Paul made four missionary journeys recorded in the Bible, always thinking about going to new places where the gospel had never been preached before. The first modern missionary would be William Carey. He's known as the father of modern missions, he went to India, to Serampur and Calcutta. And, the you know, when William Carey went, it was not easy. His church was against it. If his father thought he was crazy, his, re his wife refused to go. Finally, his wife went and they went with their son, Peter, but their son, Peter, died and his wife had to be put in uh, some sort of mental institution. And... Uh, the first seven years he was in India, he did not see a single person except Christ. He spent long amounts of time translating and learning the new languages of Bengali. And he worked for years translating the Bible into Bengali, showed it to someone, and, and they realized it just was not very good. He had to do the whole thing over again. So, he, but he endured. One person asked him what was the secret of his success, and he said, I can plod. That means I can keep going. He did eventually start uh, a number of churches and hospitals and schools and greatly impacted the area because he endured. Amy Carmichael, who started uh, that orphanage in South India in Donover, and um, she would rescue girls who are being given to the temple to be temple dancers. And that meant more like prostitutes, but she saved them and let them grow up in the orphanage. Uh, Hudson Taylor, who went to the inland parts of China. And he was one of the first missionaries to really dress like the Chinese people. And, and, and many were drawn to him because of that. Very effective. Jackie Pollinger, who reached the opium addicts in Hong Kong. And when she first went, she couldn't find an agency to work with. She just went on her own and helped many get off of opium and won many to Christ. Started all her own ministry. Sadhu Sundar Singh, who went often to Tibet. And India has the advantage where you can go within your own country and still be a missionary because there's so many different languages and states. Like this is Reverend Punraj, who's from Tamil Nadu, but has spent many, many years in Bihar, reaching the people there. And, uh, and YWAM as well. This is Saji and Sheena Thomas, who pioneered the YWAM base in Cochin, and now they lead they pioneered and lead the base in Kampala, Uganda. So God wants to use you to pioneer some new thing somewhere. You have that vision in you, speak it out and, and work on that and pray on that. Because we're all meant to be a part of missions, of outreach. Uh, now, it doesn't mean we're all meant to be full-time missionaries. Some people go. Some people are senders, some are supporters, some are people who pray, some train. It's just like during a war, you know, you have some soldiers on the front lines, but you also have people working in the factory. You have people uh, training airplane pilots. You have people who are strategizing. So there's many different things and ways we can be involved. But Matthew 28, 19 to 20, Jesus said, 
Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So we all need to be a part of that. This is John Piper. He's from my hometown, Minneapolis, Minnesota, but I've never seen him in person. But he's a pastor of a large church, and he is, a, I would say, a missionary sender. He really promotes missions. Here's a little clip of him preaching about missions. You belong to God. He made you. You exist for Him. The unwasted life is the life that puts Christ on display as supremely valuable. A God-centered theology has to be a missionary theology. There are only three kinds of Christians when it comes to missions. Zealous goers, zealous senders, and disobedient. The reason we go is because we have the absolute confidence that the one in whose name we go has all authority, therefore nothing can stop him. The need of the nations who do not know the name of Jesus is an immeasurable need. It's an infinite need. 2.6 billion people live in unreached people groups. seems to be woven into the very fabric of our consumer culture that we move toward comfort, toward security, toward ease, toward safety, away from stress, away from trouble, away from danger, and it ought to be exactly the opposite. So don't ask God, am I supposed to be involved in missions? Ask God, how am I supposed to be involved in missions? I'll play you this video from Lauren Cunningham in case you haven't seen it yet. In the beginning, God created man in his own image. He walked with man in the cool of Eden, but sin interrupted that union. So God created the missionary. God said, I need someone willing to say no to the status quo, no to the dream of wealth, leave their families to fly to a distant land and learn a language they have never heard, ride in cramped buses on backs of camels, someone who would sleep anywhere, eat anything, bear the heat and fight the freeze with a smile on their face just to take the gospel to a people not their own. So God created the missionary. God said, because the harvest is plentiful, I need someone ready to sow the seed, to plow the ground, water the seed, and reap the harvest which is ripe. Someone to go and train, to multiply the crops, and to answer the call and pay the price. So God created the missionary. God said, I need someone who is a radical servant of all, taking the lowliest job, washing the feet of the poor, caring for the sick and cleaning their wounds. I need someone to visit the prisoner, care for the widow and the orphan to sit in the dust with a child and tell them that they are loved. So God made a missionary. God said he needed someone who would believe that blind eyes could see and lame feet could walk and that the dead could live again. Someone who would pray long hours and intercede through the night with wordless groans of petition so that one soul might be saved. 
God said, I need someone honest and brave, full of grace, mercy, and compassion, free from fear and passivity, walking in true identity, someone burning with love and girded with truth, someone who radiantly reflects God's glory. So God made a missionary. God said, I need someone who would say yes before they were asked. Someone who would go to distant islands, barren deserts, inner cities, closed nations, next door neighbors, and prestigious universities to reach the unreached. Who would hike any mountain and endure any obstacle because how will they believe in him of whom they have never heard? How will they hear unless someone preaches? And how will they preach unless they are sent? So God made the missionary. So that's the 30 spiritual gifts, and I hope through watching this teaching that you're getting an idea of which gifts you have, which gifts you don't have, maybe also which gifts that you don't have yet, but you're going to grow in. So discovering your spiritual gifts, how do you really find them? Well, one, look at what interests you. What do you like to do? What do you take an interest in? That's a big clue to your spiritual gift. Number two, how do you spend your time? Do you spend your time strumming on the guitar? Well, that could be the gift of music. Do you spend your time reading books? Maybe the gift of teacher. Do you spend your time uh, kind of talking to people and giving them advice? Well, maybe you're an exhorter. Do you tend to comfort people? You're a mercy person. You see, look at how you spend your time. Do you like to travel? Well, that could be the gift of missionary. You see, do you always like to go around and meet new people, the neighbors? And well, that could be the gift of evangelism. So how do you naturally spend your time? I mean, I from even before I was a Christian, I always liked to read books. So that was an indication that I would be uh, more of a teacher type person. Number three, what do friends think your gifts are? Sometimes your friends can see their, your gifts before you. So ask your friends, what do they think your spiritual gifts are? Number four, where are you the greatest blessing to others? You know, when you do different Christian activities, which ones do you do? Do you have people come to you and say, oh, that was really good? You know, and I've, do, I've done different things in ministry. Some things I do, you know, I get by, but I don't have people coming and saying that was really good. <laughs> right? But other things I do, I do have people saying I was really impacted by that. So that gives you a clue to your gifting. Spiritual gifts tests. Uh, there are actually many online now. You can actually find apps, spiritual gift test apps, and take spiritual gift tests on your phone. Now, the thing is, if you haven't tried everything yet, you might score zero on some gifts because you just haven't tried them. So don't let that limit you, but that might give you a clue. And then try everything and see what gifts you are into. So that's what the outreach is all about and, and, and the lecture phase too, is to give you a chance to try different things. And then you can see what you enjoy, what you don't, what you're good at, what you, you know, what you have an interest in and what you don't. Okay. So experiment around and grow in your spiritual gifts. In 2 Timothy 1, 6 to 7, Paul wrote, for this reason, I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. 
For God did not give us a spirit of timidity, but a spirit of power, love, and self-discipline. So we are meant to try to work on growing in our spiritual gifts. So now you're wondering, well, how do I grow in my spiritual gifts? One, read books about them, okay? Uh, for example, when I was interested in getting the gift of tongues, I read a bunch of books about the Holy Spirit, about tongues, to kind of get myself ready. I like to read books about teaching because I enjoy teaching. I like to read books about the gift of prophecy because I'm into that. So find books about the gift you are interested in, okay? Or websites you know, uh, things on the internet, videos, that sort of thing. Uh, spend time with the people who use the gift that interests you. How did the disciples become so effective in casting out demons and healing people after Jesus had had gone up? Well, because they had spent time with Jesus. That I know, I know one friend who is really amazingly effective in casting out demons and spiritual warfare. And I asked him, how did you learn this? And it came from him spending time with one particular person who was gifted in this. And he just learned from being with that person. Step out in small ways and expand the bigger things. So if you're into speaking, don't expect to be invited to some big church to preach the sermon. You'll probably start out in a small group or one-on-one, -on -one. whatever opportunities you have, step out in small ways. Reinhard Bonnke used to preach to the trees. Billy Graham, when he started, he would go into bars, preach, and then he'd be kicked out of the bar, and he'd go to another bar and preach, and they would kick him out. Everyone starts small. Four, get formal training where it can help. So in YWAM, for example, you're into worship. We have schools of worship. We also have schools of music and missions. We have the SBS, the School of Biblical Studies. We have the Discipleship Bible School. We have the School of Supernatural Ministry I just took. We have counseling schools. So many schools are there in YWAM, or you may go outside of YWAM, of course, and there's whole degrees you could take on certain things, depending on what your interest is. So go forward with your spiritual gifts in love. Because if you don't minister them in love, they're worthless. 1 Corinthians 13, 1 to 3. If I speak in the tongues of men or angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, I do not, but I do not have love, I gain nothing. So we need the minister in love to give everything value. Let the light of Jesus shine through the stained glass of your spiritual gifts. Remember, if there's no light, the gifts won't do any good. So in a sense, your spiritual gifts are like the different colors of the stained glass, and Jesus is the light. And, and he shines through each one of us in a unique way. And as we abide in him, that is what allows the light to shine through us. And then my final advice is, whatever dream or vision God gives you, and that will relate to your gifts, go for it. Follow that dream. Do that thing that God has given you. I'm reminded of this woman, Susan Boyle, who was a housewife from uh, England, and uh, she could sing. You know, she thought she could sing, and she, she really had a dream that she could be a great singer, though she doesn't really look like a, a singer, does she? Well, people laughed at her when she told them that she was thinking of being a singer, but she decided to follow that dream, 
and she entered a contest called Britain's Got Talent. And here's what happened. <laughs> Hi, what's your name, darling? My name is Susan Boyle. Okay, uh, Susan, and where are you from? I am from Blackburn near Bathgate, West Lothian. It's a big town. It's a sort of collection of... It's a collection of... Uh, villages. I to think there. And how old are you, Susan? I am 47. <laughs> and that's just one side of me. Okay, what's the dream? I, I'm trying to be a professional singer. And why hasn't it worked out so far, Susan? Well, I've never been given the chance before, but he's hoping it'll change. Okay, and who would you like to be as successful as? Elaine Page. Elaine like Page. That. What are you going to sing tonight? I'm going to sing I Dreamed a Dream from the Miserables. Okay, big song. <laughs> yeah? Yes. Susan Piers. Without a doubt, that was the biggest surprise I have had in three years on this show. When you stood there with that cheeky grin and said, I, I want to be like Elaine Page, everyone was laughing at you. No one is laughing now. That was stunning, an incredible performance. Amazing. I'm reeling from shock How about you two, but I am so thrilled because I know that everybody was against you. I honestly think that we were all being very cynical and I think that's the biggest wake up call ever. And I just want to say that it was a complete privilege listening to that. It was instant brilliant. 
Susan, I knew the minute you walked out... <laughs> oh, Simon! ..on that stage <laughs> that we were going to hear something <laughs> extraordinary, and I was right. <laughs> Not a lot of touch. Susan, you are a little tiger, aren't you? Oh, I don't know about that. You are? I don't know about that. OK, moment of truth. Here's yes or no. The biggest yes I have ever given anybody. <laughs> Amanda? Yes, definitely. That's brilliant. Amanda, you too! Susan Boyle, you can go back to the village with your head held high. It's three S's. So for whatever dream or vision God gives you, hang on to that and go for it. God wants you to fully use your spiritual gifts. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. And I hope that you see more what your gifts are. And may God use you greatly in the future. That's all, folks.